good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. And um, I am just absolutely thrilled and delighted that we get to welcome this morning Dr. Kathy Grieg in our midst. I know she doesn't need an introduction. She's a longtime friend of St. Paul's, beloved teacher, professor at Virginia Theological Seminary, a well-known biblical scholar. She now directs the Center for Anglican Communion Studies at Virginia Theological Seminary. We get an extra special treat because Dr. Grieb is also teaching a New Testament course this semester, this year, this semester, semester. this semester. And I think we get a bit of a sneak peek into some of the themes that she's going to be exploring in this as well. So I'm going to say no, nothing further so <laughs> we can begin to hear Dr. Thank Kathy you. Grieb. Thank, Thank you, Jenny, for the, your invitation. Thank you. People of St. Paul's, one of my favorite places to come because I know I'll get good questions and that people will know, will understand intuitively what I'm talking about because you all, as, as Lisa mentioned, we actually believe this stuff. <laughs> <laughs> it's so fun. It's fun to be here. Um, let's begin with a, a prayer, a familiar prayer for you. The Lord be with you. And God also with you. Let us pray. Blessed Lord, who caused all holy scriptures to be written for our learning, grant us so to hear them, read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest them, that we may embrace and ever hold fast the blessed hope of everlasting life, which you have given us in our Savior Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. Amen. Um, so I am um, going to be to, to stay close to somewhere between 35 and 40 minutes. Um, and if I'm looking like I'm not going to, would you wave violently at me? Uh, because I want to make sure that we have some time to talk about what I'm going to say. Um, and, um, these are th these are ideas that in some ways are, are not new at all, but in it sometimes when you hear it a little bit differently, it raises questions and things. So, so I'm going to give you some theory and then some, some demonstration from um, a couple of, so parable and paradox, um, so some theory first, and then a couple of examples from parables, and then a couple of examples of paradoxical thinking um, in hymnody, particularly, when, you, when we want to teach theology. Um, my favorite way to do it is to, is to sing it, <laughs> is to sing our theology. We won't actually sing um, this morning, but we'll, we'll uh, think about it. Anyway, we'll think about the words that we sing. We sing our theology in this church. So, parable. Our English word parable comes from the Greek word parabola. And that has to do with putting, para means side. So putting two things side by side um, for a comparison. Using one to shed light on the other. Um, and usually the more difficult or abstract idea is put next to something simpler, something more familiar, something we, we do understand. And so um, that the one sheds light on the other. Um, parable then is a kind of simile, remember from, this is what you're going back to high school English. Um, so simile um, is a comparison that uses the words like or as. So uh, my love is like a red, red rose, said Robert Burns. And, and we immediately want to know, well, let's hope she's not too much like a red, red rose. Is she, is she prickly? Um, is, her, is her, you know, this part green and this part, you know, red? Um, no, but so we, so the, one of the first things that happens in a simile is we start doing the work that the poet has, has laid upon us. In what ways is my love like a red, red rose? In what ways is she not like a red, red rose? Um, from the psalm, Psalm 42, as the deer longs for the water brooks, so longs my heart for you, O God. It's a love, wonderful image because we see this, this thirsty deer, uh, desperate for water, coming to a water hole, getting the water that the deer needs to go on, to go on living. And, and, and we think with the psalmist, what would it be like to, to know that our, our need for God is as strong as that? and to be able to, to own that. Um, so it's very it's a powerful language. So that's a simile, and then metaphor is bolder. The comparison is made directly without the, the words like or as, another Psalm 31. Be my strong rock, a castle to keep me safe. 
for you are my crag and my stronghold. And again, we do the work, okay, God has, is a rock. Well, um, I don't know that we worship rocks, <laughs> uh, is it? So in what ways is God, we, we start thinking about the qualities of a, of a rock. What is rockness? It's strong. It's, in the desert, the rock, a rock finding a, a strong, tall rock can make the difference whether you make it or not. In the shadow of the rock, it's 20 or 30 degrees colder than it is in the blazing sun. Um, you can feel it in, in, in immediately if you step behind a rock. Uh, but a rock is something you can hide behind when your enemies are shooting arrows at you. Um, a rock is a place where it, if it has a little uh, cleft in it, you can hide yourself in the cleft of the rock. So all these ways of, of, of talking about God as a rock, as a castle, a safe place. Um, God is not a rock. God is not a castle. So the, the, um, someone has said poetry is one of the very few ways of where you're allowed to say something that is not true um, and get away with it. So God is, God is not a rock, but, but God is my rock and my salvation, my safe, my castle, my safe hold. Okay. So parabola, um, I'd invite you to challenge your, channel your high school geometry class. I've drawn you a parable. My parable isn't very good because it was done uh, in a hurry yesterday afternoon. Uh, but a real parable would be, the two sides would be absolutely identical. Um, and that, and you can chart it and measure it along a, an imaginary center line that I've drawn with a, a dotted line. The two sides are mirror images of each other. They are exactly alike, mirror opposites. But in poetry, part of the power of a metaphor or comparison is the asymmetrical quality of the comparison. So, um, the, so and, and one of the ways that I'm reminded of that when I want to remember that is, is the last few lines of Archibald MacLeish's Ars Poetica, I've given them to you. A poem should be equal to, not true. For all the history of grief, an empty doorway and a maple leaf. For love, the leaning grasses and two lights above the sea. A poem should not mean, but be. So I love this, this ending to, to Ars, the Art of Poetry, Ars Poetica, um, because it, it talks about the asymmetrical quality of comparisons that are, um, that are so important. You, 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 we, do, we look at something um, that could be even almost trivial, and then suddenly see that it has a great weight, a great power. Um, when we use it in a context, in a theological context. And I'll have to demonstrate that for you in a few minutes. So a parable, as you will see, is much more than the common meaning that you may find in a dictionary. Um, I, I um, did a, a Wikipedia search for parable, a short realistic story that is written to teach a moral or religious lesson. That's what I got. A parable, a short realistic story that is written to teach a moral or religious lesson and a parable was put next to Aesop's fables as a, uh, as a, a kind of, so it's a story that has a point, that, you, that the bottom line, the take home, and the moral of the story is um, that that's what your take home is. And if we think about some of the Aesop's fables that are maybe most familiar, the boy who cried wolf, okay, moral of the story is you know, don't lie because people won't believe you and when you actually need people to believe you, they won't anymore. So or the lion and the mouse, um, the line that is rescued by, by a mouse that would say, I'll do you a favor someday, and the, mouse, and the lion says, right, how could you ever do me a favor? Well, then when the lion is caught in a great big net, the mouse knows what to do and, and, and frees the, the lion. So you can, um, doing a favor for someone, even if you don't think it's going to result in anything good for you, is just a smart thing to do. Or, uh, you know. So you, there's, a, there's a takeaway that you're going to hit the hare and the tortoise, Slow and steady wins the race. That's the, pro the sort of proverb that you have at the end of the story. That's the takeaway. If that's all that a parable is, then, then um, Jesus is like Aesop, you know, um, you know sort of friendly advice that is, you know, here, here's, the, here's a little story and here's something to take away to, uh, to remember to, to live a little bit better or a little bit wiser than you did before you heard Jesus. Um, I'm going to say that that's a really shallow definition of parable. <laughs> um, but uh, that's, that's often what people think of when they think of parables. Um, 
that's, so let's see if we can problematize that a little bit in a minute. Um, paradox, the other word that we're playing with this morning, also comes from the Greek word para, side, or alongside of, and doxa can mean glory, as in the doxology, but the more common meaning in ancient uh, philosophical Greek was opinion, um, and even false opinion. So uh, opinion was as opposed to reason, where you, you thought something through carefully, like Socrates did, and, that, and then other people just had opinions, things that they hadn't particularly thought about well. So it can mean, it, so it has that, that meaning. Um, originally, it meant a statement contrary to accepted opinion. Uh, that is, um, so a, um, an assumption that wasn't grounded or founded on anything good, from the Greek paradoxon, contrary opinion. So here's a sound philosophical opinion, and then here's this other idea um, that you um, that that isn't really worth worth having. But uh, something happened along the way around the 15th or 16th century, and its meaning shifted from that to describe something that seems um, yeah. It's, it's hard. <laughs> we can relate. <laughs> okay. Um, the sh its meaning shifted from that idea of false opinion or mistaken opinion to describe something that seems absurd or self-contradictory, something that doesn't make any sense or doesn't make any sense at first until you, the first time you look at it, it doesn't make any sense. The second time you look at it, you say, oh, I wonder, you know, I wonder what about that. So here's, here's an example. Um, um, in a paradox, he has discovered that stepping back from his job has increased the rewards he gets from it. So at first, at first glance, he would say that, no, that's not how it works. The more, the more you invest in your work, the more you get out of it, right? But maybe not. Maybe sometimes stepping back, you know, going on that vacation, taking that day off, um, just step away from it and you see suddenly uh, so things fall into place. Things, it's just, and, and we all sort of know that from experience. But that's paradoxical. We don't, it's not what we expect to happen. It's, a, it's sort of contrary to our, our, our way we think something works. Now there, are, there is a meaning of paradox that refers to something stupid or silly, as in Gilbert and Sullivan's The Pirates of Penzance, where uh, those of you who know the, the, uh, the operetta will remember that poor Frederick um, has been, his, his uh, nursery maid was um, hard of hearing and not very bright. So she uh, apprenticed him uh, to a pirate instead of a pilot, which was supposed to happen. Um, and so he was apprenticed to a pirate until his, the date of his 21st birthday. And that's the, le the language that is used, the legal language, until his 21st birthday. The problem is that Frederick was born on February 29th. So he had, had leap he's a leap year baby, and um, he only has a birthday every four years. So if it had said until he has 21 years of age, that would have been fine, but it says what the language says until his 21st birthday, so he doesn't have a birthday. He will, he's stuck with this pirate for another 40 years. And so they sing, sing a song about a paradox, a paradox, a most ingenious paradox. <laughs> yeah, no. And so Frederick says, even though I'm 21, I am a little boy of five. You know, it's, and, it's, and it's funny and it's kind of stupid uh, because you just sort of say immediately, well, who drafted that? <laughs> so, or they should have checked the date he was born before they drafted it. Okay. Or another example of a silly paradox, I might be silly, if you posit the case, as people do, of a barber who shaves the beard of every man who does not shave his own beard. Okay, did you get that for a minute? If the barber shaves the beard of every man who does not shave his own beard, question, does he shave his own beard or not? <laughs> okay. That's, that's a, a logical paradox. Don't lose a whole lot of sleep over this. It's not worth it. It's really not worth it. So these are fun, but not really important. But I'm, I'm going to argue that in Christian theology, some of the deepest, most profound truths we assert and believe can only be conveyed in the language of paradox. So parable and paradox. So let's jump into a couple of parables. I picked um, a parable that you all, probably the most known, well-known parable, one of the most known, well-known parables 
Um, so I'm going to cut, whip through it because I know you know it, and then make some. Pen and then I've given you a, a series of a couple of more parables about the, the reign of God um, that are that that so we can think about how we talk. How do we talk about the reign of God that is invisible, something we can't point to and say that's the reign of God? What Jesus did was say that the reign of God, the kingdom of God, is like this. So uh, it did again and again and again. So. Um, here we go. Jesus teaching uh, beside the sea. He gets into a boat on the sea. Those of you who are nautical will immediately appreciate that. Um, the, the hill makes a natural um, auditorium, and the water conducts the sound, uh, so he could be heard um, in, a, in a boat just offshore. And began to teach them many things in parables and said, Listen, a sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seed fell on the path. The birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it didn't have much soil. It sprang up quickly since it didn't have any depth of soil. But when the sun came, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Notice how much time is spent on that particular seed. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it. It yielded no grain. Other seed fell into good soil and brought forth grain, growing up and increasing and yielding fantastic harvests. 30, 60, and 100 fold in the ancient world, you would never get that. Let anyone with ears to hear, listen. So if we, if we were to think about a parable the way that, like Aesop's fable, your takeaway would be, if you, put the, if you put your seed in good soil, you'll get a good crop, something like that. That's, what, that's all you would get from a parable like this. All right, when Jesus is alone with the, with the 12, they asked him about the parable. Um, and he it gives a, a very strange theory of parables that's, that's, that we, if we had a course on Mark, we could talk more about. Um, but here, he, then he explains the parable to the disciples. Um, now at verse 14, the sower sows the word. These are the ones on the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes, takes away the word that is sown in them. And these are the ones that are sown on rocky ground. This is where the time was spent in the parable. And when they hear the word, they immediately receive it with joy, but they have no root and endure only for a while. And when trouble or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And when, the, when Jesus is arrested and all the disciples disappear, the same language is used. They all, you will all fall away, he says. And Peter says, no, I'll follow you to the death. And they all say, sure, I'm not, nobody's gonna, we're not leaving you. And then, you know, when the moment comes, they all fall away. So, um, so that, that's just, and then others are sown among the thorns. These are the ones who hear the word, but the cares of the world, the lure of wealth, and the desire for other things come in and choke the word. And we immediately remember the story about the rich young man who wants to follow Jesus. Jesus says, sure. Um, to sell everything you have and come and follow me. And he turns away sad because he has a lot of stuff and he doesn't want to lose it. His stuff really owns him. And he sees that, but he doesn't, at least at that moment, um, doesn't, can't do anything about it. So, so, we, so we, re we see that everything in Mark is related to everything else, like most of the Gospels. And, and so we see that already this is anticipated in chapter four, even though we won't meet him until significantly later in the Gospel. And these are the ones sown on the good soil. They hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30 and 60 and 100 fold. Then we have a couple of other little parables, really interesting. Is a lamp brought in to be put under the bushel basket or under the bed and not on the lampstand? Um, this is interesting enough in English, but when you hear it in Greek, it says, does a lamp come? to be put under a bushel basket or under a bed or and not on the lampstand. I don't know about you, but my lamps don't travel. So this is a <laughs> this is a Christological parable. This is a this is does a does a lamp come? Jesus is the light here. Does the light come to be put under a bushel basket or under a bed and not on the lampstand? And nothing is hidden except to be disclosed. Nothing is secret except to come to light. Um, and then, then he goes on, um, the, the reign of God is as if someone would scatter seed on the ground and would sleep, rise, night and day, the, and the seed would sprout and grow. He doesn't know how. He, the, the farmer puts it in, in the ground, you know, throws a little water on it, and, and, and it's, uh, the, the word there in Greek is automaton, 
of itself auto- automatically as it feels seems like the seed just does it of course it's 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 god is god is causing this to happen uh, the earth produces of itself there's the automaton lens first the stalk then the head then the full grain in the head and when it's ripe then he goes in with the sickle the, the harvest is coming the, so the miraculous quality of, of the reign of god is is hinted at in that parable um, and then here's another one. With what shall we compare the reign of God? You know, what, what, what do we put next to on the other side of the reign of God? What parable, what parabola will we use for it? It's like a mustard seed, which when sown upon the ground is the smallest of all the seeds on earth. When it's grown, it shows, it's sown, it grows up and becomes the greatest of all shrubs, put forth large branches. The birds of the air can make its nest in its shade. So the, the, the reign of God starts out as something tiny and, and then mushrooms into something huge and, and wonderful. And we hear the summary statement from Mark. With many such parables, he spoke the word to them as they were able to hear it. He didn't say anything except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. So we have a, a public and a private thing that is then disrupted later in the gospel when it's clear that the disciples don't understand any better than anybody else. So, uh, but that's okay, we'll, we'll, that's, uh, we'll save that for another time. Let's look at, at a parable by Matthew. This is Matthew from Matthew 20. Um, it's one of my very favorite parables because, in part because everybody hates it. Um, <laughs> nobody loves this parable. Management hates this parable. Labor hates this parable. Anyone who cares about justice understood in one way, hates this parable, and I know that you will have an opinion about it too. <laughs> For the reign of God of the greater heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for their usual daily, daily wage, a denarius, a day's pay, he sent them into his vineyard. When he went out about nine o'clock in the morning, he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard, I'll pay you whatever is right. So they went. He went out again about noon, and one, um, about three o'clock in, in, in the afternoon, and did the same thing. And then about five o'clock in the afternoon, almost quitting time, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? They said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also, go into the vineyard. When evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, Call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. Now we notice immediately that it didn't have to be that way. If he had called the laborers who came at five o'clock in the morning and given them their, their daily wage, they would have been thrilled and gone on their way rejoicing. But this, was, this, is, this, has a, this parable has an edge to it uh, that we're supposed to feel. So instead of beginning with those who started at five o'clock in the morning, he began with those who started at five o'clock in the afternoon. So um, when, when those hired about five o'clock came, each one of them received the usual daily wage. Now when the first come, the five o'clock in the morning people came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, these last worked only one hour. And you've made them equal to us who've borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, friend, friend, friend in this, is, in this uh, parable is like amigo. It doesn't necessarily mean I like you. It means look buddy, something like that. Okay. Look buddy, I'm doing, I'm doing you no wrong. Didn't we make a deal that you were gonna get the, the daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give this last the same as I give to you. Can I do what I want with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first and the first will be last. Okay, now, um, I w- what is wonderful about this parable is that unless we're very careful, we're going to identify with the people who come at, came at five o'clock in the morning and think this is rotten. The only way you can get this, the only way that this parable is like the kingdom of heaven is if we can adopt the point of view of a day laborer. 
So we have to, um, every time I'm, I think of this parable, whenever I'm on 410, because there's a little place that's sort of like a 7-Eleven, where uh, people wait in the morning hoping to be picked up for painting or digging a ditch or some other low, lower skill task where you suddenly need people that you've never seen before and will never see again for the day, hire, hire people just for one day. Um, and so a guy drives, it's, it's, it, it, you, the guy drives up, he goes in, gets his cup of coffee, he says, okay, I need three painters and one, um, one person who can, um, a carpenter. And people were take me, take me, take me. And he takes three and the one, and everybody else is left, left there. And they're hoping another guy will come along in a truck and do the same thing, but maybe they don't. And so that means that that family doesn't eat that night. They don't have, there isn't, any, there isn't anything to, 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 you know, they can't get any, the, what they need. They don't have the cash that is, that is needed. That's their source of income. So imagine this, you're, you've, been, you've been standing by that stupid store all day and trucks, a couple of trucks have come by but they haven't chosen you and you're just thinking about how hard it's gonna be to go home and say, I don't have anything today. Um, we, can't, we can't buy food today. And then suddenly a guy shows up in a truck at five o'clock in the afternoon and says, you, you still wanna work today? You say, yeah, yeah, of course. Yeah, okay, you go and work. And so, and then when it's pay, pay time, you're handed a whole day's wage. Not because you earned it, but because you need it. And that's what the reign of heaven is like. That's what the kingdom of heaven is like. And if we can just make that shift where we picture ourselves as a non-hired uh, day laborer, we get it. We get what the reign of God is like. And Matthew, can, Matthew has done that to us, required us. This is not a simple takeaway point in the moral of the story is. This, is, this requires a whole conversion of, a, of our point of view so that we can think like somebody that, that we probably aren't. We can, we can imagine ourselves into a situation and then we understand something about how we don't really want justice. What we, 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 this, the, these people didn't earn a whole day. So we, don't, we wanted what, we, what really is necessary for the reign of is, is mercy, is, is the kind of generous love that gives people what they need rather than what they deserve. And wow, what a parable, right? So, um, okay, that'll come around sometime this year. It's Matthew, you're coming up. Yeah. So you'll have some time to think about it before you get there, and don't just hate it. <laughs> All, right. All right, we have uh, some, I'm um, looking at the time. Um, oh yeah, how does this happen? All right, um, let's look at some hymns. To, to this, uh, I chose some of my favorite hymns that are, but I could have chosen a million more. We, when, um, when we, when we sing our theology, as we do in hymns, um, we're, we're doing a combination of appreciating the poetry, it really is poetry, and loving the music. And sometimes we're loving the, loving the music and just singing the words without paying a whole lot of attention. But other times we sort of stop and say, what exactly are we saying here and isn't it wonderful? So let's look at a few of them. The first one I, I, I had to take from the 1940 hymnal, it's not in our 1982 hymnal, um, but it's uh, from uh, Cecil Francis Alexander who wrote a number of hymns, especially hymns for children, but some hymns that are definitely not for children. This one is a, um, a Holy Week hymn, and we just need the first verse. His are the thousand sparkling rills, streams, that from a thousand fountains burst and fill with music all the hills, and yet, he says, I thirst. So, when you think about Jesus as the creator, and the, the word was made, um, the, the, all creation was made by the word, the word of God, the word made flesh in Jesus Christ, and in, I'm in John, Johannine mode here, uh, and it, because it's in John's gospel that one of the last words on the cross is, I thirst. So, the, the one who made all the, all the water uh, all those oceans and streams and rills that, that, that fill us with such beauty and, and such, and uh, is, is the one who hangs on the cross and says, I'm thirsty, thirst. It's, it's ironic, it's also paradoxical, um, the, the, how the creator can be suffering from, from thirst. Um, but there are, there are the really important paradoxes in Christian theology that, and they are right at the center, right at the core of our faith, how God uh, can become human. 
Um, in, the, in the ancient Greek work, Greco-Roman pantheon, this is not surprising. Zeus catted around like mad, and uh, anybody who couldn't run fast uh, was likely to become impregnated by Zeus and, or, or another god. And so you had lots of people who were half and half, half divine and half human. And some people think, that's, that's, who haven't been, had much training in the church or in theology, they assume that that's what we are saying when we're talking about, about Jesus. His mother was Mary, was human, his father was God, was the Holy Spirit, and so Jesus is half and half. Uh, but that's not what Christianity asserts at all. We assert in the creed that, that Jesus Christ is fully human and fully God. And as soon as you say that, you are immediately in the world of paradox. It's not possible. It doesn't make any sense. It, doesn't, it seems absolutely uh, un, un... You can't do that. <laughs> you can't do that. You, you, they're too, you can't be holy this and holy that when they're opposites. Okay? How, do, how, can that, how does that work? Well, it, it works because what it does is problematize what we, what we think we know about reality, which is how people are born from you know, two, different, two different families and become something. Um, and uh, it's different. It's, and then the, there, there are other paradoxes about the, um, the, the Trinity. It's paradoxical. God is three in one, one God um, in three persons. And so somebody, somebody wonderful like Dorothy Sayers says, when she goes to the Eucharist before breakfast, she says, yes, yeah, so I have to confess six impossible things before breakfast. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's, it's, um, it's, it's it, our, our faith, our creedal tradition is, is filled with paradoxical statements, important paradoxical statements, not stupid ones like the barber. Okay, so let's look at some more of the, this language that is paradoxical. We won't have time to do all of them. It's all the way through the church year, so I picked a hymn from Christmas and from Passion Hymn, Easter and Ascension. But the, this Christmas hymn is just is one of my favorites. A stable lamp is lighted whose glow shall wake the sky. The stars shall bend their voices and every stone shall cry. And every stone shall cry and straw like gold shall shine. We're in the, immediately we go to the fairy tale where the, the young woman has to spin straw into gold. Um, so it's, it's a, a barn shall harbor heaven. How is that possible? It's not possible. A, a stall becomes a shrine. You know. um, this child through David's city shall ride and triumph by. The palm shall strew its branches and every stone shall cry. And every stone shall cry, though heavy, dull, and dumb. A stone can't cry out. But Jesus said, remember, that if, if these were silent, if you tell your disciples to be quiet. Jesus said, if these were quiet, the stones would, would cry out. So the Richard Wilbur has picked up on that image and, um, and played with that. And uh, the, every stone shall cry, though heavy, dull, and dumb, and lie within the roadway to pave his kingdom come. Yet he shall be forsaken and yielded up to die. The sky shall groan and darken, and every stone shall cry. And every stone shall cry for stony hearts of men. God's blood upon the spearhead, God's love refused again. God's blood on the spear of the soldier that jabbed the side of Jesus on the cross. But now, as at the ending, the low is lifted high. So now we have Luther's hymn, well, attributed to Luther, the cattle are lowing, the baby awakes, so a play on words between, the low is lifted high, the, cat, the cattle, the, the cattle are, are singing, but the low is lifted high on the cross. So, at the, at, so it's, it's a wonderful play on words. The stars shall bend their voices and every stone shall cry, and every stone shall cry in praises of the child by whose descent among us the worlds are reconciled wonderful paradoxical language. If we go back to Holy Week, it's a hymn by Fred Pratt Green that um, helps us, I think, forgive if we're inclined to hate the people who did this to Jesus. It, it helps us to humanize them and to remember that we might very well have done the same thing in their place. To mock your reign, O dearest Lord, they made a crown of thorns, set you with taunts, along that road from which no one returns. They did not know, as we do now, that glorious is your crown, that thorns would flower upon your brow, your sorrows heal our own. 
In mock acclaim, O oh gracious Lord, they snatched a purple cloak. Your passion turned, for all they cared, into a soldier's joke. They did not know, as we do now, that though we merit blame, you will your robe of mercy throw around our naked shame. See what he's doing here? Using the imagery from the passion narrative uh, to, to frame it theologically. A sceptered reed, O patient Lord, they thrust into your hand and acted out their grim charade to its appointed end. They did not know, as we do now, though empires rise and fall, your kingdom shall not cease to grow till love embraces all. Um, I think we have just enough time to, to look at Easter. Uh, this is a very old hymn. Um, and um, it's just filled with metaphorical language. Er, you can't, what, what's the expression? I, it, you shouldn't use it any, you, you, sh you can't hardly swing a dead cat in a phone booth without hitting a metaphor, and this is a horrible expression. I just, I hope my, my cat never hears me say that. <laughs> but you get the idea, okay? Lots and lots of them. At the Lamb's High Feast, we sing praise to our victorious king who has washed us in the tide flowing from his pierced side. Just a little stab wound with this tide. Now it's a tide that wa washes us. Praise we him whose love divine gives his sacred blood for wine, gives his body for the feast, Christ the victim, Christ the priest. Where the paschal blood is poured, Passover, Death's dark angel sheathes his sword. We're back in Exodus at the, at the time of the, the houses being marked with the, with the, the door lintels by, to keep the angel of death from killing the firstborn. Israel's host triumphant go through the wave that drowns the foe. There we are at the Red, crossing the Red Sea. Praise we Christ whose blood was shed, paschal victim, paschal bread. With sincerity and love eat we manna from above. And there we are in the wilderness with Moses and the Israelites. Mighty victim from on high, hell's fierce powers beneath thee lie. Thou hast conquered in the fight, thou hast brought us life and light. Now no more can death appall, now no more the grave enthrall. Thou hast opened paradise, Christ as the second Adam, returning us to that where that angel was with those the sword that barred the way back into Eden. And, uh, and that in thee our, the saints shall rise. So just to, this is just a few. I think we, we, if we're going to have any time for questions or comments, we better take it now. Um, so let's stop.